Spirit who are actually teaching your soul how to be godly, how to be godlike, because your spirit is already godly and godlike. That aren't the will of God. Not everything that happens in life is the will of God. That's why we pray your kingdom come and will be done. It's a new creation, not a fixing up of the old man. That old man's been killed. It's a new creation, the Bible calls it, your new creation. Hello and welcome to Times of Refreshing again. My name is Pastor Doug Bryce and I am the pastor in Decorah, Iowa at Christian Life Center. I want to say hello to all the people up there today and I am excited to be with you again as we work uh, through uh, the teaching of the Word of God. And it's been a privilege to do this uh, now for quite a while. And we're going to take a little bit of a different uh, look at today. Usually I spend time going through the scriptures, you know, scripture by scripture. I tell you to get your Bible. And, uh, and to check out what I'm saying, because the Apostle Paul said that's an important thing, that people know uh, what the Word of God says for themselves, and they're checking out what the, the people who are preaching and teaching are saying to see if it's accurate with the Scriptures. And today I want to uh, start out in Matthew chapter uh, 22, and use that as a, a, a leap pad or a jump pad to what I want to talk about today, what's on my heart, uh, something that God's been kind of building in me as a, an evangelistic tool to reach out to people when I meet them and want to get in discussions. And I want to give you some of these uh, tools too, or at least these handles that you can use um, when it comes to time when you discuss uh, faith things with people. Because it's important that as a follower of Christ, we are out. Jesus said, go. And when we go, we run into people with different belief systems and faith systems and no faith at all. And how can we engage in meaning, meaningful dialogue? How can we be a light to them? How can we bring truth into that? I want to talk about that today. And so if you have your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 22. I'm going to pray, and then we'll dig further in. So, Father, we thank you for this time. I ask that it will be fruitful to myself as I preach and teach, and the Holy Spirit works through me. May it come in back into the, my own heart and mind and bear fruit for you and also for those who would hear. Father, I ask that you would help us to make ourselves a light, to not hide ourselves under a bushel, but to put ourselves on a hill, that anybody who is in darkness who chooses to come toward the light, to come towards Christ, which is in us, the hope of glory, that we would be there, we would be available for them to draw, uh, be drawn towards you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as I get started uh, today, I, I have to admit that I, what I'm going to teach and preach, I have drawn off heavily from one of my favorite speakers, Robbie Zacharias. And uh, if you don't know him, I would encourage you to, to, uh, to Google him or YouTube him and, and listen to what he has to say. He he speaks to a lot of different people in a lot of different places from the United Nations, the universities. And uh, one of his taglines is helping believers to think and thinkers to believe. It's something along, along the lines like that. And there is, in a sense, a crisis. I don't know if we call it a crisis, a crisis in the church that we as Christians don't know how to present our faith. We don't know how to do what the Bible says, how to give a hope for uh, an answer for the hope that we have. And uh, I want to do that because there are a lot of people who are out in the world who are lost, who are looking for value and purpose and meaning, and they find it, they try to find it in all kinds of different areas, but it's only found in Christ. And so I'm going to come from a certain direction, and a lot of that direction was influenced by Robbie, and you'll you hear that uh, in this if you're familiar with him or when you find it. But uh, one of the first questions that I want to begin to put out there to you um, and to the thinking world, maybe you come across this broadcast and you're not even a believer. And if that's the case, I want to let you know that this is not by accident that you're here. God, who you may not believe in, has brought you here to hear this. And maybe you are a believer and uh, you've been looking for a better way to engage people in discussions of faith. And this will be one avenue uh, that I hope will help you. But we begin to, as you begin to dive into the world, no matter what a person may believe, uh, they have a value on humanity. And I want to come out of the scriptures really quickly in Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 34, and then we're going to come off of that and kind of lay this into a, a method of thinking, uh, of looking at the world and helping other, other people look at it. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 and on, it's, it's the time when Jesus states what the two greatest commandments are. Uh, and it starts out here. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor 
as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So Jesus puts a priority, uh, an amazing priority on number one, loving God, but also Christians on loving our neighbor. And of course, if you're familiar with the parable of the Samaritan, uh, then uh, you know that our neighbor can be anybody that it really needs love and needs help. And so we're to love. And so Jesus puts love as a primary uh, commandment, a primary foundation that people are supposed to do. Number one, love God. And then out of that, number two, love people. Now, I want to make sure that you hear me very clearly on this. Um, there are people, and we're going to talk specifically with atheism or agnostics today, that you may have in your family or your life or your friends that you know. They are very good people and they love people. And what I want to encourage you today is that this is, I pray to God that I can bring this across right, but we want to talk rationally and objectively about faith here. There can be people who don't believe in God who love others, who are good moral people in our world. They're good moral people, and they love people better than some Christians and churchgoers do. And let's put that right out there. But my question is, why should somebody who doesn't believe in God, why should somebody have to love people? The Christian here is called to love, to have to love, because Christ says these are the two greatest commandments. You love God, and if you love God, you love people, because God loves people. But why should, outside of a, a belief system, why should we have to believe? Uh, how, why would an atheist have to love their neighbor? Why would an atheist have to uh, be kind to somebody? And a lot of the times when you get into discussion with somebody, you'll say, they'll say, well, you know, it's, it's, better, it's to create a better society. And what I want to get at is, the, uh, say, why is it important to have a better society? What is it, when it comes down to two things, the question that I want to ask is, what does it mean to be a human? And I want to look at that from a faith perspective, from a Christianity perspective. It's very clear what it is to be a human. You, you have intense value. And we're going to look at that. You're created in the image of God. But if you take it from the worldview of uh, an atheist, a skeptic who says there is no God, and you put that question in there, what does it mean to be human? And that's a challenging question for them. Because the scientific answer is nothing. You're, you're just a collection of atoms and your DNA, as Richard Dawkins says, you're just dancing to your DNA. You come from a purposeless beginning. And so I want to lay this out. If you're a person who doesn't have faith, you don't believe there's a God, you need to know you come from a beginning that has no value. You have no purpose. Life accidentally came. The universe accidentally came to being. There was no cause or purpose or mind or value that brought the, per, the, the, uh, the universe into being. And so you have an accidental cause that was uncaused. It was uncaused without purpose. And so if, the, if your beginning is uncaused, then, then if you have no value, there was no value to the beginning, then there's no value to what's here. And see, so people don't live that way. We value what it is to be human. You value what it is to be human. Every one of us crave for human rights. So what does it mean to be human? Let me, let me share a few things. What it means to be human is that every person, regardless of what they believe, how they live, has value. They don't have value because of something they do, because, they are better, because they're a better football player or a better musician or a better actor or actress. It's, they don't have value because of that. It's not of what they do. That doesn't bring them value. They have value because of who they are. Every person has intrinsic value, a value that is uh, in, in unique to them because of who they are. Now, that can't come from naturalism. That can't come from your university professor who teaches that there's no God. Because in naturalism and atheism, there is no value to human life. We just an accident has come. Uh, Bertrand Russell said uh, that philosophers, uh, that we've grown from a protozoan. He was a famous atheist, a mathematician, who denied there was a God. And even Bertrand Russell uh, himself says something along these lines. He says, uh, we've grown from the protozoan to, to, to the philosopher, and the philosopher think that's a good thing, but, maybe, but the, the protozoan would beg to differ. So we, as, uh, what I mean by that is the, just because we've changed, if evolution is true, we've changed and we've grown, there's no value to that. There's no ultimate value to that. But every person has rights. Now, you can be a believer and an atheist and, and still believe that, but I want you to give me a rational reason why. You can believe that, but you're standing with your belief not founded on anything. You're standing with your feet, your, your fa uh, your feet planted firmly in midair. Why do you have the faith 
Why do you have the belief if you're an atheist or you're a skeptic, you don't believe in God, why do you have faith that humanity has any value at all? That's the rational objective discussion that I would like to have with you, or that as a Christian, you need to learn how to, in the context of love, bring that question into your friends who may not believe. Why, you could say to your atheist, your friend who's an atheist or a skeptic, why do you have faith that people have value? What is your foundation for that, ultimately? Uh, we have rights. What does it mean to be human? It means you have rights. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself, where do human rights come from? Think about that. This is another good question to ask uh, a, a friend of yours who may not be a believer, another way to engage them into a conversation. Have you ever stopped to ask, where do human rights come from? Or even uh, uh, maybe a tougher question, why do we value human rights so much? Why do we crave our rights so much? Boy, there's not a, you want the easiest way to get people to screaming, begin to trample on someone on their rights or someone uh, that they love on their rights. And you'll have people say, well, it's my right, it's my right. Why do we as human crave and demand rights. How come it's in human nature to demand rights? And why should any human have any right at all? Why should humans have rights? What does it mean to have humans? When you come from a Christian, or why have human rights? When you come from the Christian worldview, that is easy to explain and understood, and I'll get into that here in just a bit. But if you come from a naturalist worldview, why should anybody have rights? In the, in the kingdom of the animal world, is there rights? And we're nothing more than animals. Why is there rights? Well, to make society better. Well, why is that a good thing? And we, we can give these answers, but we don't have a rational reason when you, don't have, uh, when you come from a, a skeptical worldview or a naturalist worldview. And so why do we have rights? Why do we have rights? We'll get into that. You know what it means to be human? It means to be creative. Humans are creative. You and I will never have to worry about the animal kingdom, and this will seem silly to you. You'll never have to, the human race will never have to worry about the animal kingdom coming together, putting the full force of their creativity together, and coming up with some mass weapon of destruction to punish us evil humans for all the destruction we brought on to their world. Because animals don't have the type of creativity that humans have. You'll never have a dog start a subway, start a, a, a chain of restaurants to challenge Subway. Because it's in the humanity, what it is to be human, to be created in the image and likeness of God, is to have the value and to be able to create and have, be creative because our, our, uh, who we came from was creative. And so we have that. And what does it mean to be human? Our thoughts are meaningful. What you think is meaningful. Even whether it's wrong, or it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong, when you have thought, there is, there is meaning to your thoughts because it comes from you. What does it mean to be human? Our feelings are important. Our feelings are important. That's important. What does it mean to be human? We should love and be loved. Love is important to humans. Now, if you're, if you're someone who follows uh, 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 Richard Dawkins and, and that stripe of, uh, of atheism, you would have to say love, like, the athe like uh, Dawkins does, is uh, that love is not even real, really. It's just, it's just uh, uh, dancing to our DNA. It's just chemical reactions that physically uh, happen in our body, and it's not even a reality. It's just, it's just a complex makeup of physical reactions. And I hope this is, a, this is a, I know this t teaching today is, is a turn from where I normally go, but it's also a heart of mine. Uh, what does it mean to be human? Number seven, we have a desire to have purpose for our life. I don't know any human being, I've never cross, run across any human being who doesn't desire to have purpose for their life. Why do we crave to have purpose for our life? What does it mean to be human? Right now I have these seven things. We have value no matter what we do. Not based on what we do. We have value because of who we are. Number two, what does it mean to be human? We have, we have rights. What does it mean to be human? We're creative. Our thoughts are meaningful. Our feelings are important. Love is important. And we desire to have a purpose for our life. Every person I know, in fact, that's what America lives on. 
America lives and dies on uh, the idea that you have to have a purpose. They sell you certain things. The whole, the whole idea of marketing is to market an idea, a culture, a brand, or something that you would take in as your own, and you would identify with that so that you will buy their product. They're trying to build a culture and identity around you, and we pursue that, pursue it, especially in the West, especially in America. We're looking, I have to have a purpose for my life, so we, we do all the different things to our bodies. Some people do this, or some people go after business, or some people go after relationships or sports, or we do things, uh, whatever it may be. We're looking for a purpose. Human, humanity is driven by the desire to have purpose. In fact, I would even say, if you want to put it this way, humanity is driven or is imprisoned by the desire to have purpose. Now, where does that come out of if we have a purposeless beginning? If we have a beginning that does not include God and does not have a purpose, why then is it in the heart of humanity to have purpose? Why, is it crave, why do people crave so much to have purpose? Even those who would come along, come and have done the, the route of suicide, which can be very painful, even they wish they had a purpose. And sometimes it's the loss of that purpose or the idea that they can never get back to the purpose that drives them to such a point. Humanity is imprisoned to the desire to have purpose in their life. Now I say that's because God created us with a purpose. The first cause had a purpose for us, and because the first, God has, the first cause has a purpose, we have in our DNA uh, this desire to have purpose. But if you come from the idea that there is no God, then there is no purpose. If you have a beginning that does not have a value, then you don't have a value. Now, a lot, what a lot of times we do is we say, well, there's no real ultimate purpose in life. That's right, Pastor. There's nothing that's real. Everything is nihilistic and everything, there's no meaning to everything, really. And, uh, but our little purposes, we just do this and that. But that's, if we're doing that, we're just tranquilizing our boredom. And see, you don't live without a purpose. You live with a purpose. My question is, why do, you have pur why do you desire purpose? Why do you desire rights? Why do you desire love? Why do you desire forgiveness? And that brings me into the idea that there are four struggles with the human soul. There are four struggles with the human soul. And the first is this idea that the reality and the problem of evil. Within the heart of humans is this problem of evil. We don't like to see evil. That's what I'm saying. We don't like to, when someone does something evil to us or, or uh, something evil to our loved ones or we see some dictator do something evil to somebody. And, and, and that word evil is not used much anymore. You notice in horrendous crimes or, or, or in almost any level of society, we don't use the word evil because evil um, brings the connotation that there's something wrong, something morally wrong. And we don't want to bring a moral into it. Uh, but yet we'll, we have this problem with evil. In fact, many people will say there can't be a God because there's so much evil, there's so much suffering in the world. But when, they, when someone brings that, and this is maybe where you can connect with your unbelieving relative or unbelieving friend, and, and they may bring this point up, there can't be a God because of all the problems in the world. And, you know, what they're saying there, they don't understand what they're saying. They're assuming that there's, uh, that there's value there's assuming that there shouldn't be evil. Why shouldn't there be evil? Why, why shouldn't there be evil? You know, and you, and you have this idea and the reality of the problem of evil. And so let me, let me take you down a line of thinking that Robbie likes to take people down, and it's this. And he says, if you say there's such a thing as evil, you must believe there's such a thing as good. And most everybody will agree with that. If, if, if someone who's a non-believer says, well, you know, there can't be God because there's so much evil, they'll also believe that there's good. And the next step to that is, well, if, if there is uh, both evil and good, there must be some kind of a moral law on which to make a differentiation between what is good and what is evil. I mean, on what basis are you and I saying something is evil and something is good? And most people will agree with you that there must be some kind of a standard or moral law on which to say what is good and what is evil. And then when it comes down to this, they must come to the idea that if there's a moral law, there must be a moral law giver. And a lot of people don't want to go there. They don't want to go to the moral law giver because that's who they're trying to disprove. But if you don't have a moral law giver, then you don't have a moral law. And if you don't have a moral law, you don't have good or evil. 
And so things kind of implode. And why do we need a moral law giver? Because when you talk about evil, as Robbie says, when you talk about evil, you are, you are always, when a person talks about evil, they're always talking about a, a humanity tied into it. So when evil is talked about, it's always talked about about, a, about a, a person or by people. You and I would never, you and I would never come up to, uh, you and I come up to the situation where a cougar attacks a, a, a mother deer and, and slaughters a mother deer and, and, uh, and the little baby gets away. We would never call that cougar evil. But if you take a man who slaughters a, a mom in front of the child, you would call that man evil. Why the difference? Because there is something valuable about humans. In the, the, in the idea that there is something evil is the assumption that people are valuable. And if people are valuable, then there can be good and evil, and there are, can be things that go wrong that are not right. But if you and I don't have value, then there really can be, there can be real, uh, no real evil to anything. We can have little categories, but those categories are arbitrary. They're random. They're not, they're not objective. They're not fixed. It's just whatever culture says. So we have the reality and the problem of evil. There's also another struggle in the human soul, and that's the cry for justice. You know what? Justice should be served here. Whether it's, whether it's uh, taking care of our poor, the poverty, we need to have justice and, and fix that, which is true. Or justice against a crime, or justice in some sense. There is a, there is, humans are, are inbred with this idea that there must be justice. It's just in humanity. Another struggle of the human soul is this need for love. We need love. Humans need love. We, we are built, we are created to receive love and to give love. And again, that does not come from naturalism. If, it's from, if you come, uh, love is not real in naturalism. If it's anything, it is just uh, the, the actions of the body, the actions of these, the DNA that's going. And it's not real from the outside. It's not real from the outside. But we are created with the need for love. People need to love and to be loved. And we see that from the beginning when a baby's born and they respond to human touch. Or if a baby doesn't be, is not touched, that, that la lack of love is, it makes an effect on them later in life. And finally, there's a fourth struggle to humanity. That is the, the need for forgiveness. Everybody needs forgiveness. I doubt if there's one of us in this life, and one of us who is hearing me right now, who, is, who has uh, never been grateful that somebody forgave them. What I mean is that there's a time in your life when somebody did forgive you for something that you did. And when they did forgive you, that was very meaningful to you. It freed you up. It took a burden off your shoulders and out of your heart and off your life, off your life. when you received forgiveness. What is it about the human soul that needs forgiveness? That cherishes, to be, that cherishes the thought that somebody would forgive you for something that you've done. And so there are, there, are, there are four struggles of the human soul. This wrestling with evil. Why is there evil? The cry for human justice. What do we do about evil? The need for love and the need for forgiveness. And when you get into the idea of the, the big ideas, the big things of, of, um, of purpose and value, here science fails to give an answer. Science can tell you what has happened uh, in the universe, but it can't tell you why. When you look at a cake, science can take that cake apart and tell you what, uh, what made this cake, the specific ingredients and even the processes to, to bring this cake into being, but it can't tell you why the cake is there. And we're here and we're sitting in this world, we live in this beautiful world, and science can take apart uh, what this world has done and, and what's gone on in this world but it, and how it got here, but it can't tell you why. It can't tell you why there's anything at all. Science fails there and it will never reach that point because it's not a scientific a, a measure. You can't, you can't figure out the why are we here through science. And so here's some ultimate questions that people have to deal with, humans have to deal with. The origin, why am I here? Why do we have anything instead of nothing? If there was nothing in the beginning, a true nothing, an absence of everything, why do we have anything? And then we bring it down to a personal level of your life and my life. Why am I here? Why am I here? We have a second thing of ultimate questions. 
purpose? What brings me meaning? Again, this is one of those traps. I don't know if you like the word traps. Humanity is, is imprisoned to this idea that we have to have meaning. And we're looking for meaning that's, that's true. A, a humans crave for meaning that's true. Not some, not some uh, uh, ghost or, or, or shadow of meaning is what I mean. Humans crave uh, the reality of meaning in their life. Not some shadow that says, uh, you, you have meaning. Tell me why I have meaning. What brings me meaning? And, and, and people are driven uh, to find meaning. Morality, what's right or wrong? There's ultimate questions about our life. What's right or what's wrong? How, do we, how can we legitimately say something's wrong or something's right? How can we legitimately say Stalin is wrong for killing the millions of people that he did? Or that Hitler was wrong for what he did? Or Jeffrey Dahmer for what he did? Or all, you could go into any case, or, what, or maybe the boss who passed you over for promotion. How can you say anything is wrong? Where do we get the basis? That's the ultimate question for an objective set uh, of standards. And then finally, the ultimate question. What happens when I die? Is there a hope beyond this life? Do I just come to an end? What happens when humanity dies? Bertrand Russell says, if you're an atheist, you had, Bertrand Russell rightly concludes that uh, all the great achievements of humanity are useless because our solar system will collapse and eventually everything we've ever done will be nothing. So what purpose is there anything that, uh, that, that humanity has ever done? And what purpose is there in achieving anything if the universe is just going to squash it? The universe doesn't care, but I'll tell you who does care, God. God cares. There's three problems with humanity, lust, greed, and pride, and only Christianity tackles the reason why. There's no worldview out there who does any honest justice to these three problems. The lust, the lust of humanity, and that's to always have more, greed, and the pride. Only Christianity deals with that honestly. So let me, ask, let me answer the own, my question I asked you earlier. Where do human rights come from? The Constitution? What about a nation that doesn't have a Constitution? Does that mean those people shouldn't have rights? Of course not. We believe every human should have a right. And you know what? The Constitution of the United States of America is not built to tell us why we have individual rights. The Constitution, it doesn't tell us why we have rights. The Constitution tells us what our rights are. The Constitution was put together for liberty and peace and growth in our union. But it doesn't tell us why we have rights. The Constitution doesn't. It only tells us what our rights are. The Constitution does not stand alone. It stands upon another document called the Declaration of Independence. And here's why we have rights. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator, with certain unalienable, unalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Why do people deserve rights? Because they were created by a creator, and that's where our rights come from. Not from a constitution, not from some benevolent dictator. It, they come from God, and that's why we have human rights. That is why humans are valuable. And if you're challenging your in, in life and faith, I want to encourage you to rationally, objectively think about why do humans have value, where do our rights come from, and, and be honest in your thinking and learn to engage those who don't believe with these type of thoughts. God bless you guys. I pray that this has been beneficial for you. Amen. If you would like to buy a DVD of this program, please send $10 to KFXB-TV, 744 Main Street, Dubuque, Iowa, 52001. Please be sure to include the episode number on the screen.